All right. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kevin Bajon, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the first webinar of the BestNet TT webinar series. Of course, we know BestNet stands for the Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Network Trinidad and Tobago Project. Uh, a special welcome to all the teachers and students who are joining today with us on the Zoom platform. We are pleased that you can join us today for our presentations on the topic Pollinators and Pollination, presented by members of the BESNA TT Project Management Unit. Before we start, we have a couple housekeeping rules, um, and that is the session is being recorded uh, on Zoom and will be shared on the BESNA TT's Facebook page at a later date. Uh, in keeping with our one hour time frame, uh, the three presentations, which would approximately be 15 minutes each, will be delivered uh, in sequence. Uh, while the presentations are being delivered, you are encouraged to post as many questions as you can using the question and answer feature that's located at the taskbar at the bottom of your screen. We will try our very best to answer all questions during the live question and answer segment that will be after the presentation. However, if for whatever reason we may not be able to answer all questions, they will be addressed subsequently and posted on our Facebook page. That is Basna TT uh, project on Facebook. Um, with those ground rules um, and without further ado, I would like to introduce our first presenter, uh, Mr. Shane Bala, who will speak on the topic, the basic biology of pollination. Mr. Bala is an environmental consultant with a strong educational background in ecology, plant insect interactions, and botany. He has worked on projects with various uh, agencies, including the Ministry of Works and Transport, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, IUCN, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization, FAO, and the National Infrastructure Development Company, NEDCO, and is currently the project manager for the BESNA TT project. He specializes in plant identification, ecological assessments, and bryophytes, and is an active member of the local environmental community. So without further ado, it's over to you, Mr. Bala. Hello everyone, welcome. Thanks for joining us. My name is Shane Bala and I am a member of the local BestNet TT project team. Uh, today I'll be presenting on the basic biology of pollination. Now pollination as a subject involves um, several processes and um, we can look at this from different aspects. Uh, it is of course just one step in the reproductive cycle of plants. Now, because we have a limited amount of time, um, this presentation will cover just some of the basic principles related to pollination. At the end of the short session, um, I hope that you will have a basic understanding of the following general topics. What is pollination? The stages of pollination, the basic anatomy of flowers, an understanding of the life cycle of angiosperms. We'll discuss fertilization, and we will speak a little on the vectors or agents of pollination. So let's begin by having a look at exactly what is pollination. Let's start with the basic definition. And of course, depending on your source, you will come across slight variations, but the basic concept will always remain the same. Pollination is the main mode of sexual production in flowering plants, involving the transfer of a pollen grain we also call that the male gametophyte, from the male structure of a plant, called the anther, to a female structure, referred to as a stigma. Now, this transfer of pollen can occur from anther to stigma on the same flower or to the stigma of another flower on the same plant. This is called self-pollination. Pollination can also occur by the transfer from anther on one plant to the stigma of another plant. And when this happens, this is known as cross-pollination. Now, there are both anatomical and environmental agencies that promote cross-pollination 
mediated, of course, by a physical agent, such as wind or water, or an animal, such as an insect or bird. We will discuss these agents a bit later on in the presentation. Pollination occurs in the angiosperms or flowering plants and in the gymnosperms. In this presentation, I will focus primarily on the flowering plants. Now, the event that we know as pollination can itself be broken down into several stages. These are listed in chronological order, and they include, firstly, the release of the pollen by the male cone, in the case of the gymnosperms, or the anther, in the case of the angiosperms. Secondly, the presentation or availability of the pollen by the flower. Thirdly, up next, is the removal of the pollen by a vector or agent and its subsequent transport by the vector. In this case, our vector is a bee. Now, I will also include here the navigation of the vector. In some descriptions, both the transport and navigation of the vector are considered separate stages. I have, of course, chosen to merge them as one. Next up, number four, we have the deposition of the pollen onto the female cone, in the case of gymnosperms, or the stigmatic surface, in the case of the angiosperms. And lastly, our last stage is the successful germination of the pollen grain and its subsequent growth towards the egg. So let's recap those stages. We have the release of the pollen, the presentation of the pollen by the flower, we have the removal of the pollen, which includes its transport and navigation by the vector. We have the deposition of the pollen onto the stigma surface. And lastly, germination of the pollen grain and growth towards the egg. Before we go any further, let's talk a little bit about the sexual productive organs of the flower. Understanding the anatomy of the flower is crucial if one is to understand pollination. What are flowers? Flowers are actually modified leaves, and although they show great variation, most flowers possess four standard components, or to be more specific, four types of modified leaves. These are the sepals, the petals, the stamens, and the carpels. The petals collectively are known as the corolla, whilst the sepals collectively form the calyx. Together, these are known as the perianth. The stamens, or male reproductive structures, comprises the anther and the filament. And the carpel, or the female reproductive structure, comprises the stigma, the style, and the ovary, which contains the ovules. Now, each part serves a particular function. Generally, the green sepals protect the developing flower while still a bud. And the colorful petals serve to attract pollinators. Stamens produce pollen, which is then transferred to the carpels of stigma, from where pollen germination takes place followed by growth of the tube formed to the ovary. The genetic material travels along the tube to the ovary. Now, flowers can be either monoecious or dioecious. Most flowers are monoecious or bisexual, which means that they carry both stamens and carpels. Only a few of these species self-pollinate. Monoecious flowers are also known as perfect flowers because of the fact that they contain both types of sex organs. And of course, dioecious flowers are known as imperfect flowers. Now let's have a look at the life cycle of angiosperms. As covered earlier, reproduction in flowering plants begins with pollination, which as we discussed is the transfer of pollen from anther to stigma on the same flower or to the stigma of another flower on the same plant, which we call self-pollination, or from the anther on one plant to the stigma of another plant, cross-pollination. Now, once the pollen grain lodges on the stigma, a pollen tube goes from the pollen grain to an ovule. Two sperm nuclei then pass through the pollen tube. One of them unites with the egg nucleus and produces a zygote. The other sperm nucleus unites with two polar nuclei to produce an endosperm nucleus. The fertilized ovule then develops into a seed. Now, angiosperms are described as having an alternation of generations, consisting of a sporophyte phase and a gametophyte phase in their life cycles. 
The cells of a sporophyte body have a full complement of chromosomes. That is, the cells are diploid or 2N. This adult or sporophyte phase is the main dominant phase of an angio angiosperm's life cycle. And when you look at a flowering plant, the part that you see is the dominant sporophyte. Now the flower, depending on whether it is monoecious or dioecious, will contain the male and or female gametophytes. Angiosperms are described as being heterospores, which is to say that they generate microspores and megaspores. The pollen grain is the microspore or the male gametophyte. And the megaspores, which form an ovule that contains female gametophytes. Let's have a look at what happens inside the antos or microsporangia. The male gametophytes divide by meiosis to generate haploid microspores, which in turn undergo mitosis and give rise to pollen grains. Now each pollen grain contains two cells, one that is generative, one generative cell that will divide into two sperm, and a second cell that will become the pollen tube cell. On the other side, the ovule is the megasporangium, in which megaspores are formed. Three of these are bought, and the survivor forms the female gametophyte in which the egg cell is produced. Note that the anthers and the carpels are actually structures that shelter the actual gametophytes, which is the pollen grain and the embryo sac. Now let's have a closer look at fertilization. Sometimes we tend to confuse fertilization with pollination. Now fertilization, which is the fusion of a sperm with an egg to produce a zygote, occurs after the successful germination of the pollen grain and growth of the tube formed in the process towards the egg. The zygote develops into an embryo. After fertilization and embryo formation, the ovule develops into a seed, and the ovary develops into a fruit. Fertilization involves the gametophyte proper and can occur only after pollination has occurred. It's important to note that not all pollination events result in fertilization. Now, these are for various reasons, which we will not discuss here. Now, let's turn our attention to some of the vectors or agents of pollination. Now, the transfer of pollen can be accomplished by both abiotic agents, such as wind and water, and also by biotic agents or animals. The majority of pollination is carried out by animal pollinators, who usually are seeking some sort of nutritional reward, such as pollen and nectar, as in the case of our honeybees. Sometimes other resources present themselves, such as warmth, floral perfumes, or even oils or resins, in the case of stingless bees. In some cases, even reproductive opportunities through mimicry of potential mate by, mates by, by ornate flowers also presents itself. The relationship between the plants and their pollinators is commonly assumed to be a mutualistic one. That is to say, both parties benefit, with the plants benefiting from the transfer of pollen and the pollinators by receiving a nutritional or other type of reward. But you do have instances in which the plants appear to provide no reward, and instances in which the pollinators may also turn out to be, in fact, predacious on the plant. Some examples of the more common pollinators which you are likely to encounter include insects, of which bees are the most significant. Then you have birds and small mammals such as bats. There are even instances in which reptiles have been known to assist in pollination. I won't get into too much details of the other plant pollinators here. These will be touched on in the next sec section of this webinar. So let's have a brief recap of what we have learned. Firstly, we've learned that reproduction in flowering plants begins with pollination. Pollination being the transfer of pollen from anther to stigma on the same flower, or to the stigma of another flower on the same plant. When it occurs on the same plant, we refer to it as cell pollination, 
when it involves the transfer from one plant to another plant, we call this cross-pollination. Secondly, we've learned that pollination can be described in a number of different stages. Thirdly, we've learned that the flowers comprise the sepals, petals, stamens, and carpels, and that these are all rarely modified leaves. Fourthly, we've learned that flowering plants are described as having an alternation of generations, consisting of a dominant sporophyte phase and a much reduced gametophyte phase. Fifthly, we know that pollination is a prerequisite for fertilization. And lastly, we know that pollination can be accomplished by both abiotic agents and biotic agents, but the overwhelming majority of pollination is carried out by animal pollinators. For those of you who want to have a bit more of a read on your own, I've included here a few references which can give you some more information on pollination and also a few useful links which I myself have come across which will give you basic general information so that you can appreciate pollination, fertilization, and all of the concepts that we've just discussed today. I thank you for listening and I have left you with a couple of links that you can find some more information both on us here at BestNet TT um, related to the project. You can check us out on our web page or via Facebook or via Instagram. Thank you for listening and do enjoy the rest of the webinar. All right, thank you, Mr. Bala, for that very insightful presentation. Uh, moving right along with our agenda, our second presenter, Dr. Lena Dempervolf, will present on the topic, pollinators and the threat they face. Dr. Dempervolf is currently engaged as a biodiversity specialist at the Ministry of Planning and Development's Environmental Policy and Planning Division, or the EPPD. Her background is in pollination ecology, ecosystem services, and conservation biology. And she has worked on a number of projects in this regard over the past 10 years. So, Dr. Dempervolf, the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Lena Dempervolf, and I'll be talking about pollinators and the threats that they face. So just to remind everybody, uh, for today's discussion, we're going to talk about what animals participate in pollination, what actually defines a pollinator, and what makes a good one, uh, what is the value of animal pollinators, and what threats do animal pollinators face globally and locally. So to jump right into it, um, what animals actually contribute to pollination? Um, so there are several that you may know of and several that you may not know of. Uh, so first of all, pollinators include birds, bats, monkeys, marsupials, lemurs, bears or rabbits, deer, rodents, bees, wasps, flies, ants, butterflies and moths and many other species. So uh, the ones that you would commonly think of are maybe bees. Um, potentially hummingbirds, maybe bats, uh, but there's actually quite a lot more to pollination than you would um, than you would just consider like that. So about the bees, and these here are some stingless bees in the background. Um, not all, all bees are yellow and black, so I just kind of want to talk a little bit more about bees specifically. Um, many of them have actually quite a lot of colors. Um, so these are actually some found in Trinidad and Tobago. So we have everything from sort of green colored bees to um, orange and black bees and, and so on. Um, so there's quite a bit of diversity out there. All of these are actually bees and many of them are often actually mistaken as, as flies or other things. Um, this one up in the middle here, for example, this is something that people always call a bumblebee. It's actually not. It's a it's a carpenter bee. We don't actually have bumblebees in Trinidad. Um, there are stingless bees in Trinidad and Tobago. We have approximately nine species or at least nine species, but that also remains to be seen as we sort of would like to reevaluate this as we go along. So not only honeybees contribute to pollination, wild pollinators are actually more important. So people tend to think that honeybees 
uh, the most important pollinators because they've received a lot of publicity and they are actually quite good at what they do, um, specifically in areas where they're the plants and the bees are native in that area. Uh, however, in Trinidad they are, and Tobago, they are an introduced species. So our plants did not co-evolve with them. So that means that the wild pollinators that we're finding here, um, the bees, the flies, the wasps, the um, birds, bats, and so on, um, are far better at pollinating our local plants, including um, actually many of the crops um, than, than honeybees. So honeybees are also not the most effective pollinators. Um, again, the native bees are the ones that, that do a better job at that. That is not to say that honeybees don't pollinate anything, they do, uh, but they also have a tendency to maybe bully the um, native bees away from the food sources and so on and sort of act as competitors. So um, the point I'm really trying to make here is that native bees are very important and um, that those are also species that we need to consider when we're talking about bees and pollination. There are approximately 20,000 species of bees globally, um, so that's quite a large number, and many of them have not yet been discovered, in particular in tropical areas and the neotropics, and especially islands like Trinidad and Tobago, where there hasn't really been a lot of uh, focus on, on research into bee species. So uh, there's a good chance that we have a lot of bees out there that, that we think are other species or that we're not sure of what they actually are. So this is uh, something to consider uh, when we're looking at bees on a whole. Many of them are actually not discovered and most certainly not the relationships that they have with plants. Um, so even lizards pollinate some plants. And um, as you can see here, uh, I, I'm not aware of any of this, this happening here, but this is certainly something that happens in, in other countries. Uh, specifically, I think um, some of the the uh, drier regions and the cacti are pollinated by lizards. Something we don't often think about, uh, aquatic pollinators also exist. So there is evidence that crustaceans contribute to the pollination of seagrasses. So seagrasses are extremely important um, for wave attenuation um, and reducing sort of the impact and, and erosion of the coastline and they're also important um, areas for feeding grounds, their nurseries for fishes um, and so on. So seagrasses are very very important especially for island ecosystems and um, these also have pollinators. So Many crustaceans have been actually observed acting as these pollinators, and this is actually part of our project as well, where we will be looking into seagrass pollination in Tobago. So what actually defines a pollinator? What is causing people to call something a pollinator? There are a number of factors for successful pollination, and these are the things that make a good pollinator. So Firstly, sufficient pollen must be transferred from the anther of a flower to the stigma of the same species uh, while the pollen is viable and the stigma is receptive. So the pollen is viable means that the pollen at the time is capable of fertilizing female reproductive cells and the stigma being receptive means that the stigma is open for pollination and for receiving those pollen grains. Um, it implies that the pollinator one must carry a large number of pollen grains. For many plant species, one or two pollen grains isn't enough for uh, proper fertilization. So cucumbers or watermelon, for instance, have a lot of seeds and they require a lot of pollen grains to develop properly. So therefore, it is important that pollinators actually carry quite a bit of pollen grains on their bodies. Pollen is collected and deposited by vi while viable. So we've already discussed this. The pollen has to be uh, still in a, in a situation where the reproductive cells are going to be able to fertilize the female reproductive cells. And um, this is usually a pretty small window of time. It could just be a few hours. And it, it means that the pollinators have to be out available and doing their job during that time period. It doesn't help if the the pollen is viable in the morning, but in the evening is when you have all the pollinators out. So there's an important period where that has to match. Pollen is not modified for or during transport. Many social bees in particular modify their pollen um, by chewing it. So they chew it and they stick it onto their legs um, at these areas called pollen baskets. And they do this so that they can transport it back to the hive, which is great for them for food. 
but those pollen grains are more or less useless when it comes to pollination. Uh, that's not to say that they don't pick up all the pollen grains. Most of the time they pick up pollen grains on other parts of their body. So as they fly from flower to flower, the other pollen grains on other body parts are what actually are used for the pollination process. Pollinator visits, sorry, the pollinator visits flowers of the same species in sequence. So there's something called flower constancy, which means that the pollinator will visit the same species over and over rather than go to at least in the same trip rather than go to different species. So it is far more useful for a plant if the pollinator flies from cucumber to cucumber to cucumber to cucumber rather than cucumber, watermelon, squash and back to cucumber because that way there are many more different types of pollen grains um, that are not useful for the species in question. Pollinators possess physiological features that allow for transport of pollen grains and the deposition on stigma of target plant species. So this is a lot of the time um, refers to lots of the body hairs. So having many, many projections, body hairs, uh, many, many bees have broad legs uh, that where pollen can attach to, um, that sort of thing. So having these physiological features that allow for the transport of pollen is quite important. And these, um, these features also have to match the plant that they are pollinating. So there's very specific floral shapes that um, very specific pollinators sort of fit into almost like a lock and key. And pollinators are capable of traveling um, a long distance or the distance required between plants. So in cases where plants are separated for a, a long distance, uh, in many cases, tree species, it is important that the pollinator that pollinates those can actually cover those distances in terms of flight. And that's not the case in, in many, many circumstances because many of the very effective pollinators only travel very short distances. So many native species only travel less than 100 meters. And um, that is a concern and a consideration. So what makes a good pollinator? That entirely depends on the plants. So as we already talked about it, um, you know, if you're looking at these different shapes right here, there are many, many, many different flower shapes, and it's almost sort of a, like a lock and key situation. Some flowers have very generalist features um, that many different types of pollinators can access and can be good at pollinating. Others are very, very specific and have very intricate structures that are made only for one type of pollinator. Uh, so this is also very important to consider. So if you're planting things or if you are trying to grow things at home, um, you know, think about how many species might actually be able to pollinate your plant. So one more time, what makes a good pollinator? The physical characteristics, the body size, the body size sort of indicates how far it can go, uh, the presence and location of hairs, whether or not it has pollen baskets. However, the pollen baskets are important again. They are only really good for the food purpose and the flight distance. So how far do they fly? In terms of behavioral characteristics, um, abiotic conditions affect pollinators. If they don't like to go out in the rain, for instance, and with climate change, we're gonna have increased rainfall and increased um, drought events, sort of more extreme conditions. Uh, if that affects them negatively, then that is going to be a problem. The landscape and the habitat affects the behavior. Um, again, uh, the landscape also dictates how far something can fly. Uh, what sort of food preferences the organism has? What does it actually like to eat? Is there something more tasty nearby? Why would it go all that way? Um, whether or not they're solitary or social, because if they're social, they might tell their friends about it. And more will come to that particular plant for pollination purposes. And um, again, flower constancy. Do they stick to the same flower over and over and over, at least on one trip? Or do they go and visit a bunch of random flowers and don't really contribute? So high pollinator biodiversity equals high general biodiversity. And this is something that I just kind of want to stress because um, this is really, really the important thing. Pollination and pollinators don't just provide food for us. They also pollinate all or a very large proportion of the plants that are out there. So our local biodiversity. And then there's sort of the downstream effects of that. What do we use that for? 
we use rivers and beaches and, and nature on a whole for recreation, for spiritual purposes, for um, relaxation, for general enjoyment. Um, the plants themselves have other rules. They work in carbon storage, in nutrient cycling, in soil retention. They provide habitat for other animals. Those themselves have very specific rules. So pollination and pollinators really underpin all of these other things that are going on, which is why it's so important to keep them and maintain them and look after them. So what is actually value of animal pollination? Um, there are many different estimates. There, one particular study notes that it's estimated at 153 billion euros annually. And um, generally more than 90% of the 250,000 species of modern flowering plants that we have and know and 65% of all plant species are pollinated by animals. And that's, that's again, the really important point here. And the more we maintain our pollinator biodiversity, the more we can maintain our actual biodiversity or total biodiversity. Um, it's often been referred to as a global pollination crisis because there has been a dramatic loss and reduction in just total number and diversity and species on a whole. Uh, of pollinators on a global scale. And um, this has been recorded throughout the planet. Um, we do not have sufficient data in the Caribbean, but we do know that there are declines going on. Pollination is not accounted for and vastly undervalued regionally. So we do not account for pollination in any kind of um, national document um, anywhere in the Caribbean. So there are no physical uh, accounts being being recorded and there's no sort of financial estimate no sort of um, financial estimate of what they are worth so this is something that that is matters because in many cases uh, for persons that are not specifically interested in, in biology or the details of things um, being able to explain things in too much in terms of how much they're worth is actually far more useful than saying okay we're losing things and we need to save them but being able to explain it in terms of money is actually quite helpful. So a large proportion of the crop value is due to pollination, but it is unrecognized. Again, we are not looking at it in any kind of system. And um, there's a global shift to animal pollinated crops. So now more and more people are planting crops that are pollinated by animals rather than by wind. And um, so we have an increased demand for animal pollinators, but there's a reduced supply of them. Generally, this can not only lead to a food shortage, but also a nutrition shortage. Uh, there's a good example of vitamin A. Many animal pollinated crops produce vitamin A. And if we do not have the animal pollinators, then we do not have the crops that produce vitamin A. So this is definitely going to be a problem in countries that are already having issues in terms of food security. And again, there's a lack of general information, lack of research, in particular in small island developing states such as ours. And this is something that we're hoping to, to remedy a little bit. Um, there's also a reduction in pollinators that results in reduced global biodiversity. And again, we kind of keep on raising that over and over. Uh, that is really important. So just to kind of Highlight this, this is from some work that I had done a while ago, quite some time ago. Um, we had done some exclusion experiments just to see what the reduction in yield would be if we were to exclude pollinators. And for the hot peppers, that was around 88%. For cucumbers, it was as much as 96%. And for okra, it was about 86%. So that would be the approximate reduction that you would see if your pollinators were to disappear for these crops. So what threats do animal pollinators face globally and locally? And again, those are some of the stingless bees there in the picture. So the pollinator decline is a very serious issue. And um, again, we talk about a global pollination crisis, which is the global decline of wild pollinators and the increasing challenges with managing the pollinators. And um, we're also growing more pollinator dependent crops and we're increasing the human population. And that increases the stresses on pollinators because we require more food. For us to be able to grow more food, we clear more land. If we clear more land, we're removing the habitat for the pollinators, which reduces the pollinators. And then the pollinators cannot pollinate the food that we're trying to grow in the spaces that we just cleared. So this is a sort of a, 
um, circular problem and the way that this is solved is by improving the, manage the management of our pollinators in the fields. If we're talking about threats to pollinators on a whole, we're looking at pesticides or herbicides. Um, there are no real standards set for pollinators as far as I know within the Caribbean region. Um, with respect to pesticides and herbicides, uh, specifically for the purpose of pollinator conservation. Likely, uh, they have a similar response to the target organisms. So if you're trying to kill one type of organism, um, you're going to get a similar response to the pesticide from the pollinators. And um, there are no regulations specific to pollinators either within the Caribbean. So there's nothing protecting them that is legislated. So that's also something that we're looking at in our project. And um, there's a large number of species, uh, different species may respond differently. So it's not as simple as we're going to protect species X from certain pesticides because we know how they respond. But because pollinators or pollination is such a large group and it spans so many different, different types of organisms, because we're talking about um, anything from insects up to mammals, they will all respond differently to different pesticides. So that is something that provides a challenge for sure. And it's difficult to protect species when we don't know who they are. So we haven't recorded many of them. So, and we don't know what they pollinate and where they're found. And therefore we can't really put anything in place, which is why we need to do more research. We need to spend more time identifying these species uh, before we can do anything more. Habitat destruction and fragmentation, so quarrying, logging, housing developments, anything that removes the space that they live in, and the lack of legal protection, policies, management plans, um, general lack of knowledge, data and awareness. Um, this pertains to farmers as well as the general public. And it's actually possible that the honeybees can negatively affect native pollinators and plant species by outcompeting them. And sometimes they also overvisit flowers and they can actually destroy the the flowers and reduce the sort of um, the pollination effort that would have been put in. And again, climate change is a massive issue. And we have, while there has been some work going on in temperate countries, we don't really know how this is going to affect us in the tropics um, in terms of pollination again, because we have very little data on our actual pollinators, let alone for the sort of impacts in, in tropics and, and the tropical environments. We do know that the weather is going to become more extreme and that is going to cause challenges. We just don't quite know yet what that is going to look like in terms of pollination in our particular environment. Land use intensification is another one. So less diverse habitats and feeding grounds in and around agricultural plots and increased use of pesticides. Those are things that become problems. Um, alien invasive species, they can outcompete native species for floral resources and habitat and they can transmit parasites and diseases and diseases on a whole can be transmitted via flowers or via direct contact so those are some additional threats that pollinators face out there just to come back to the pesticide issue a little bit uh, because it's, it's, it's quite a complicated issue in general what we found through surveys and so on is that there's little pollinator knowledge which is not surprising at all given that we just don't have much information on what we actually have either and there's little value placed on pollinators. So people may generally think that pollinators are something useful, but um, that's sort of, sort of where it stops in terms of protecting them. There are a few viable support systems for persons who want to use less pesticides and who want to um, use organic methods. And the flip side of the coin is that uh, there's a high consumer demand for perfect vegetables. And in many cases, people do not like to eat or buy something that has a dent or that has a worm or that has something like that. And that is what people will respond to because if the, the driving force behind something is, is that, if people will only buy the nice plump uh, looking fruit, then that is what people will produce. And it will take a lot of pesticides to produce something like that. And therefore uh, farmers will have to respond by using the pesticides in many cases. So, you know, the consumer demand is, uh, is actually uh, one of the big problems for this, this, this pesticide issue. 
There is little knowledge of pest species we found. Um, persons sometimes don't know uh, what the specific issues are, the pests, and very often sort of broad spectrum pesticides are applied just in case. And um, there's also little knowledge of the pesticide effects, not only on pollinators, but in terms of health issues as well. And this, this kind of situation creates the perfect storm for high pesticide use uh, within Trinidad and Tobago, and I suppose by, by extension, the wider Caribbean. So just to kind of bring it back to this, it is very important to know your insects, and that's where it all starts. We need to know what we have, and we need to know what species we have that do the pollinating in order for us to go further on protecting them. So these are some ways in which you can get involved in our project. There's our website, our Facebook page, Instagram, and Twitter. We are in the process of putting up a YouTube channel as well. And um, if you need any more information, you can also email us at bestnet.tt at gmail.com. Thank you very much. All right, great. Thank you very much, Dr. Dumpable, for yet another very much inciting um, presentation. Um, I'd like to take the opportunity at this point to remind our participants that you can place your questions in the q and window that's located at the taskbar at the bottom of your screen. I do see that we have a couple of questions there already, and they will be addressed during our live q and segment that is after the final presentation. So our final presenter today is Ms. Celeste Chariandi. Uh, Ms. Chariandi is the Science and Communications Officer for the BestNet TT project. Uh, she has worked in the science communication field for over two decades and has also engaged in environmental conservation work locally with several groups. Ms. Chariandi will present on the topic pollination, why it matters to you. Ms. Chariandi, it's over to you. Thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, as a follow-up to Dr. Demperwolf's presentation, I will be emphasizing the value of pollinators to you by speaking about how the BestNet TD project will be bringing issues impacting pollinators and their conservation to the fore, and hopefully addressing these issues while also emphasizing that these efforts do not exclude you, our listening public, from an active contribution. So I'll just share the screen so that you can follow the presentation. So let us just briefly recap what makes pollination such a critical activity. Well, without pollination, the process of fruit and seed production in certain plants cannot take place. And in case we've forgotten the statistics that are shared, two thirds of the entire world's plant species depend upon animal pollination. Plants are important food sources for animals, including humans. And here is another statistic. Pollinators will contribute to one third of the food we eat. That includes a lot of our fruit and vegetables. Plant food production is a key component of a country's food security and the livelihood of many persons. Think here about our farmers, our agricultural service companies, of food distributors, wholesalers, retailers, restaurants, market vendors, health food shops, the list goes on. And pollinators also support the horticultural and tourism industries. Think about the persons operating flower shops. We could go the route of artificial flowers, but what that would also have to be coupled with artificial scents, not so? And what would your granny's garden look like if there were no blossoms? <laughs> 
Several of our bed and breakfast operations, guest houses, eco lodges, and hotels create ambience for guests by having beautiful gardens. And our tour guides depend upon the beauty of our colorful landscape to enhance their tours, showing off the exquisite and the exotic that makes coming here counter tourists instead of staying in their native country. But we get back to this stark reality that pollinators, in spite of the critical role they play, they face serious threats, and most of these are due to the actions of man. So if these important organisms are to be protected, protection will have to come through positive actions by man. So I will now outline some six actions that are on the cards for taking positive action. The first action that could be taken to conserve pollinators is research. We do not know enough about our pollinators. That was stated previously. Research will, however, enable us to uncover and collect critical information about pollinators. What kind of research? Well, there are two types of research that will be undertaken. The first type is collecting the bits of information that are scattered in various places and putting this all together in one place. This includes looking at pests and pollinators of pests. What are the so-called VAPs or very annoying pests of crops? And what are the VIPs or the very important pollinators of crops? If we know what we really need to control and do just that, and if we know what is helpful and needs protection, we can also do that. The other type of research, and we see in the pictures here, requires going into the field and seeing what is out there. When we know what is there to be protected, where it is located, and how abundant or not are these organisms, we're in a better position to help. And guess what? That help involves you as well. You can help in this investigative work. The BestNet TT project is promoting the use of a citizen scientist tool known as iNaturalist. It is an app that can be downloaded by anyone who has an interest in helping out in research. The simple thing you need to do is take a photograph of a pollinator in action, an organism on a flower, and upload that image to the iNaturalist platform. A team of experts around the world will then take that image and help to identify the organism you have photographed. It's as simple as that. The BestNet TT team is interested in engaging everyone, especially young persons, to explore using iNaturalist. So if you are a student or a teacher listening to this presentation and you are interested in helping us, please contact us to learn about the app. You may also consider building use of this app into a school-based assessment or an internal assessment. The possibilities are endless for school-based learning. We will be conducting a webinar later on in the project to introduce the app and demonstrate its use. A second way in which pollinators can be conserved is through pollinator management. Here, I would like to focus mainly on bees as key pollinators. Pollinators have evolved with specialized structures and behaviors to assist in plant pollination, and bees in particular have a whole toolkit to assist in this process. From hairy legs and the abdomen, as well as buzz pollination, they indeed critical agents of pollination, but their existence is rarely under threat due to habitat destruction, pesticide use, and many of the other ills that were pointed out by Dr. Dempelwolf. The BESNA TT project will therefore conduct workshops on bee management, focusing on ways to counteract hive destruction and save colonies of stingless bees in particular. A survey of stingless bees will be done in the field as previously mentioned. Additionally, to underscore the value of honey produced by stingless bees, an analytical laboratory study will also be conducted. But yet again, we want to emphasize the fact that there is something you can do to contribute to bee conservation. The hives of stingless bees can be saved when trees are being felled or when they are discovered in places where they're vulnerable to destruction. The photograph on the right of the screen is a screen grab taken of a video clip on the Trinidad and Tobago Beekeepers Association Facebook page. <laughs> 
It shows the removal of a colony of bees from where they're gathered in someone's yard, straight into a hive box. If you visit the page, you will see other removals conducted by members of the group. So if you're a sawmiller or just a resident who has seen a stingless bee colony you want removed safely, please send a message to Besna TT and we can help you find out how this can be accomplished. A note on the honey analysis work. This exercise we hope to begin in a few months time. The honey of stingless bees has a variety of uses both here and, and in other parts of the world. The project will conduct analyses on the properties of this honey by collecting and running tests in the lab. If you know of any uses of this type of honey locally, you can put your information in the Q&A section or send us in an email message. And if you are stingless bee beekeeper and would like to contribute a sample of stingless bee honey for this analytical work, please contact us. Moving on to the third way in which we can conserve the creation of safe havens. Pollinators require support through the creation of safe havens. This is where we introduce the concept of bee hotels or insect hotels, a sort of Airbnb for pollinators. They do a lot of work for us and we can provide a safe resting place where they can stay a while. Setting up these man-made structures in your garden also increases the chances of them doing the good job of pollination in your own yard. Besna TT is aware that at least one school in West Trinidad has explored construction of bee hotels, and we're hoping to get in contact with the team that developed this to share their experience. And yet again, we're reminding you, you can help too. These bee hotels can be constructed from very simple recyclable materials. A Google search will yield many results for ideas for construction of these hotels. Pay attention to those sites that also give guidance on where and how these hotels can be placed in your yard and how they are to be managed. I encourage you to explore and experiment. A fourth way to conserve pollinators is through landscape enhancement. Pollinator gardens are key mechanisms to create food sources, resting places, and safe havens for pollinators to thrive by providing a varied flowering plant landscape. The gardens your grandparents used to keep over flowering with flowers of every type are sadly not so commonplace anymore as people try to reduce the extra burden of yard work and land management, and maybe opting for foliage plants if any plants are saved at all. But a pollinator garden is an attractive space that can create curb appeal, while even performing a useful job of attracting and helping pollinators. Pollinator gardens incorporated in a community, school compound, or public space can also double as an education tool for interpretive activities. The Besna TT project will promote development of at least two such gardens in public spaces. So of course, you are encouraged to set up your own pollinator garden in your yard with neighbors in a community. Perhaps you're a staff member of a company that can develop one on your compound, or maybe you can influence a regional corporation to use a public park to develop one. Again, this is the type of project that has been tackled elsewhere, and many ideas for development can be found online, giving tips as listed here. However, Besna TT will share the experience of development of the two gardens, one in Trinidad and one in Tobago, in a later webinar feature, so look out for it. A fifth way of conserving pollinators is a big one, through reduced pesticide use. As mentioned, clear pesticides may be critical to food production, yet sometimes the processes used in food production are harmful to pollinators. Indiscriminate use of harmful pesticides may kill non-targeted and often beneficial organisms like pollinators. The solution is to use safer chemicals, if they must be used, apply them using better techniques, and as far as possible, use safer and more environmentally sound alternatives once these are known and are available. And how can you help? Well, 
If you are a farmer, the first thing you need to do is learn more about the pesticides you are using and if these are good choices. Use the universal code for pesticide toxicity that can be observed on the labels of these chemicals. Always try to select chemicals bearing blue or green bands on the product labels. These belong to pesticide chemical classes three and four, which are less hazardous to non-target organisms and less hazardous to you as well. You can also do research to find out if these there are other non-chemical pest control alternatives that may be used. For instance, companion plants, those planted alongside the main crop that are highly aromatic, often deter harmful pests. The marigold is known to have nematode deterrent chemicals on its roots that help protect the main crop. The oils and leaves of Portugal plants are not favored by leaf cutter ants and therefore can serve as a useful barrier crop that can provide marketable produce at the same time. As my last tip on the list for conserving pollinators, I want to underscore the importance of building your own knowledge of pollinators. So observe them in action. Use iNaturalist to identify them. Learn about which ones are important for which crops and visit the BestNet TT Facebook page to get more information and notices about free webinars that can also help build knowledge and help you take appropriate action to protect pollinators. Join us in this effort. Thank you very much. Now let's hear from you. All right, thank you very much much Ms. Chariandi. Um, participants, we have come to the end of the presentation segment of the webinar, and we will now move into the question and answer segment. So I do see we have quite a number of questions in the Q&A window. I encourage all participants to please place your questions in the Q&A window, and we will get to them shortly. So our first question is from Ms. Daniel Sukram, and she asks, has any work been done to assess the value of the services of our local pollinators? So perhaps Lena, maybe this one is best uh, directed to you. Hey, um, yes, okay, let me put on a video so at least people can see my face quick. Um, the short answer is, is no or very little. So anything beyond of, of what I had done however many years ago, which was just tip of the iceberg, uh, not really. Uh, it's stuff we really need to get done though. So if anybody's interested in that kind of research and that kind of work, uh, I strongly encourage it. And if you're interested in it, you can give me a shout and I can, can help guide you in a direction if, if that's, you know, that's your thing. All right, great. Um, so our second question uh, is from Tyler Mohammed, and she asks, are entities such as CPEP and URP and pharma groups being educated on the importance of pollinators? And if not, is that a deliverable of the BestNet project? She also has a follow-up question that uh, is asking about whether or not there is a database of local pollinators. Uh, maybe Shane can take this one. Shane? Okay. Oh, yeah. So uh, with respect to the last, let me start with the last first. Uh, so one of the outputs of the project is a compilation of a database of local plants and their pollinators. We know that there's a lot of information um, from different sources, but it's not been compiled into one place. So an output for us is a compilation of this um, that we can then share with our stakeholders and everyone. Um, in terms of CPEP and URP, not directly as entities, but because we are going to be engaging our different stakeholders, um, through different training workshops and what have you. Um, those groups will be covered. Um, certainly the farmer groups will be invited to, to attend um, the pollinator gardens and the workshops that we have planned. Yeah. All right, thanks Shane. Um, our next question is from Mariella. It's quite an interesting question. And she asks, are parrots considered to be pollinators? Um, I am not a bird person, so I cannot, um, <laughs> I cannot vouch for that. I want to go on the, the, the side of no. I know that they're definitely dispersing seeds, so they're certainly involved in seed dispersal, but, um, we will have a, a few more webinars coming up, uh, for specific groups. Um, our next one is going to be 
bats, bees, and um, aquatic pollinators. And then the follow up one after that is going to include birds. So um, be sure to stay tuned for that one. <laughs> I think I'll defer that question to that time. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so we have two questions from Lisa. And Lisa asks, are pollinators harmful to humans in a home garden? Or can they coexist at the same time uh, in a home garden, for example, the large bees that are attracted to the heliconia flower that buzz very loudly, are those harmful to humans? And her second question is, uh, what are other ways that we can help with the research? So I think, Lena, you mentioned some, some um, initiatives in terms of research, so she wants to know what are some ways she can help. Okay, so first off, are they harmful? No, not at all. Um, people are always worried about getting stung by bees and so on. The only time that bees might become aggressive is when you're close to their hive. So when you hear about instances where um, farmers are getting stung and so on, it's because they are plowing fields and accidentally plowing through nests or uh, very near to nests and so on. Many, many, many of the bee species are actually solitary. They're not, they're not social and you don't have that sort of situation. And most certainly when they're out foraging, they're very, very docile. Um, unless you accidentally step on one or squish one and they defend themselves and it's a life or death situation, they're not going to bother you. Um, so the best thing is to just leave them. The loud ones that you're thinking of that are buzzing, those are carpenter bees. They usually make um, very round holes into wooden cavities or wooden areas. And um, that's where they live. So if that's where you see them, um, that's fine. But again, they're extremely docile out in the field and the solitary ones, including the carpenter bees, they wouldn't harm you. Um, Celeste, do you want to take the one maybe on what can be done? Celeste, are you hearing us? Ah, yes. <laughs> yes, Lena. Um, there was a question that was asked regarding um, interaction with farmers and so on. Well, I wanted to update our listeners that um, as part of the activities under this project, we actually set up certain working groups. And there is a particular working group that is focused on uh, communication and having done a knowledge attitudes and practices survey at the start of this project, we are collating the information received from that and identifying specific target groups to whom we would direct our um, communication. So certainly farmers are one of those that would be addressed, as well as there are particular activities um, in which we would be engaging beekeepers. Another um, survey was undertaken that has gathered some information about persons who are currently managing stingless bees, as well as those who are interested in managing stingless bees and finding out more about them. Uh, so I think that addresses one of the questions that is also there in the chat on how can persons become engaged in the workshops. If you haven't taken part in these surveys, uh, I, my suggestion is to send an email to us in the chat, we have posted the email address for the project, and you can always send an email to us and we can see how we can accommodate you in these various activities that we have planned. Thank you. All right, thanks so much, Celeste. And with there being no more questions in the Q&A, and we're just five minutes over time, um, I think we can proceed to wrap up the webinar. So on behalf of the BestNet TT project team, I'd like to thank you for your interest and participation in today's session. Uh, please remember that a recording of the webinar as well as responses uh, to, to these questions will be posted on our Facebook page and that is BestNet TT. Um, I encourage you to save the date for our next webinar, which will be on Wednesday, 23rd March, 2022. And it'll be on the topic pollinator types, which will introduce the different types of pollinator groups found here in Trinidad and Tobago. And it goes from bats to bees to birds and aquatic pollinators. So again, follow the team on Facebook, uh, on Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. It's all at Bestnet TT. So we look forward to your continued interest and engagement with the project and the project team. And I thank you and bid you a good rest of the day. Thanks, everyone.